Uh, you need to stop sitting. Amen. Come on, I need some more joy. <laughs> like, I don't know, really? Like, we need to stop sitting. Amen. Let us together stand. We'll go to God in the closing prayer. I uh, want to thank everybody for coming uh, today. It's not enough to give an announcement. Because there may be some individuals here on this morning and you may say, you know what? I know I need to stop. Brother Williams, it is clear I have dysfunction in my life. But I need somebody to help me walk out. You can't, there are some sins you just can't get out of. There are some sins you gotta, you gotta walk out. And for many, we don't preach, we don't teach, we don't talk enough about how to get out of sin. So you come week in and week out with the guilt. Have anybody ever felt guilty? And it's the guilt that God, I know I'm not right, but I need some help on how to get right. Can somebody talk about, can, can somebody share the steps on when you need a breakthrough and you stuck? Ain't it a horrible feeling to be stuck? I talked about a few weeks ago, I got stuck in the ditch and it didn't matter how much I pressed on the gas, mud just flew everywhere. I tried to put it in reverse and I, and I pressed the gas and I'm, I'm stuck. And you know what happens when you're stuck? You need someone else to latch on and help pull you out. Because by the power that you had, if you had enough power on your own, you would have just pressed and just drug your own self out. But there are some sins, there are some things, there are some sins, it tastes so sweet, you just can't get out. Some of y'all right now can say, hey, no more cookies. You start crying right now. There are some, there are some things, there are some addictions, there, there are some traps by Satan that once you taste it, once you touch it, touch it once you get involved, the memory, the desire, it stays with you. And so what I want to talk about, here we are in 2 Kings chapter 5 and beginning at verse 1. Now Naaman was the captain of the host of the king of Syria. He wasn't the king. He was a general. He was a captain of the army of Syria. Not only was he a captain, uh, but the Bible says he was a great what? He was a great man. He was not a man who just had a position, but he was a great man who also had an honorable po a position in the army of Syria. The Bible says, with his master, the Bible says he was honorable because by him the Lord had given him deliverance unto Syria. Matter of fact, the Bible says that one of the reasons why he was great is because God had given him victories. Matter of fact, some of the reason why you are where you are is because God allowed you to be where you are. Amen. So the Bible says the reason why, one of the, the main reasons he's in this position is not because of the type of man he is, is because God gave him deliverance. God gave him victories. Have you ever been in a situation and said, God, I'm, I'm in such a bad place, I just need a victory. I need some good news. God, I need my next phone call to be some type of blessing or breakthrough. Have you ever seen your phone ring and you looked at it and say, nah, that ain't the break. God, that's not, that message ain't from the Lord. That's another message where you just, you need a breakthrough. So the Bible says he has a, he has a great position. He's a captain. Number two, he's an honorable man. Yeah. Number three, he's a great man. Hey, ain't that a good combination? Amen. And the Bible says that when he goes out to battle, he wins. <laughs> and one of the reasons he wins is because God lets him win. Yeah. 
God gives him victories. So because God is with him and God supports what he's doing, he looks good and he's respected. But he has all of these wonderful things. But at the end of the verse, the Bible says, but. Don't we all have a but in our life? Oh, somebody says, uh, have, have anybody ever been on an interview and somebody says, tell me a little bit about yourself? And you got to talking about yourself and you start saying, hey, I think I've done a lot. Have you ever got impressed with yourself? Like you forgot? Well, tell me a little bit about yourself. Well, you know, I went to the university of such and such and I did this and I uh, started a program, uh, you know, and I work with uh, snails and tadpoles. I, I free the birds and, you know, I work with nature and, you know, I free whales. I go in the water, I free the whales, and, you know, and you got, you have this beautiful resume. And you know what? And when people look at you, you know what they say? You're a great person. But have you ever felt like you looked at your resume, but you didn't feel like your resume? Because you know your sins. And when, and when you know your sins, it bothers you. You don't feel great. When you walk in the room, it's that, there he goes. There she go. Oh, she is. And don't you hate when people brag on you right after you finish sinning? <laughs> and they just brag. Now this sister right here, she is one of the purest sisters. And, and you sent that with. <laughs> you, you ain't that pure. When you ain't that clean. When you ain't that holy. And you have such a wonderful resume. Isn't his, isn't his resume wonderful? It's, it's wonderful, but the problem is he's a leper. Now the problem with leprosy is there's no cure for leprosy. So you can imagine someone who has great wealth and respect and honor has probably searched all throughout the land trying to get a cure for this condition that everybody can see. So yes, you are a captain. The king of Syria honors you and the people know that you're a great man. And, and matter of fact, every battle that you go out, you win those battles. But there's one thing in your life that just stays with you. It's that sin that's, that was there in 2018. And guess what? We only a few days into 2019 and it's still with you. I know what you said in January 1st. Lord, I'm leaving it behind. I'm done. January 3rd, God help me. <laughs> Mercy, Jesus. It's still there. It's, it's, that, it's that thing at the end of your resume that always humbles you. It's that, it's that thing in your life that causes you not to speak so loudly. Matter of fact, it's that sin that people mistake your humility for being righteous. Your humility is produced because you sin. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm just a, a lowly Christian. I'm, I'm only here to serve the Lord. I don't, I don't wanna bother nobody. I, I love everybody. The only reason you that humble is because you can't beat that sin. And it got a hold of you. So it humbles you. It's not the word of God that humbles you and it's not righteousness that humbles you. It's the idea that you keep falling and you keep falling and you keep falling. So you know what? If I'm going to fall, at least I'm not going to put myself on display. So you know what we end up doing? We end up retreating and hiding. Because if I'm gonna fall, at, at least let me fall in front of a small crowd. Yeah. Right? Who, who wants to fall on stage? <laughs> if, I'm gonna, if I'm gonna trip and fall, Lord help me, not, let, it, let it not be. 
<laughs> you know, <laughs> but nobody wants to fall on stage. No. You know, nobody wants to fall in front of a bunch of people. Yeah. Nobody wants to fall in, in front of a bunch of people. So you know what we do? We stay in the back. Because I don't want nobody to ever see how much I fall. The reason why we don't, you, you may have 50 friends and one of them are, is a Christian. And we like to sometimes, the people we worship with, we like to keep people we worship with far away from our life. Because if I'm going to fall, I don't want to hear no verse. I don't want to hear no scripture. Well, brother, you know, uh, John, I don't want to hear John. <laughs> tell me what Philip says. Tell me what Derek said. Huh? Don't tell me what John says. So what we end up doing is the people that are surrounding us, we keep them close who are non-Christians. You ever heard somebody say, I get along with non-Christians better than I do with Christians? You know one of the reasons why? Because many non-Christians won't hold you accountable for scriptures that they don't even know. How can I hold you accountable for scriptures I don't read? So I'm never gonna bring scriptures to your remembrance because I don't read, matter of fact, I don't read the scriptures and matter of fact, if, if, if something was, was brought up that needed to change, I'm not the one to help you lead, to lead you closer to God. So sometimes that's why we like hanging around people who don't know God like we know God so that we can be comfortable falling. <laughs> Until somebody comes into the environment and says, you need to change. Naaman's at a point where he's stuck because he has this wonderful life. He has his wife, he's, he has all his prestige, but he can't really enjoy it like he want to enjoy it because he got that thing at the end of his resume. Very quickly. In Luke chapter 8, verse 43, and a woman, and a woman having an issue of blood for how long? Have you ever sat down and thought about how long you've been dealing with your sin? Now everybody has one. Everybody has one. Everybody has that thing at the end of your resume. Everybody has. And some of us, we have four and five. Page three, please. <laughs> Everybody has that thing. Have anybody ever sat down and you counted how many years you've been dealing with that sin? Now notice, we were all children at some point. You, you have not always struggled with that. At what age, at what age did you start struggling with that sin? And at what age did you start struggling with this sin? Have you counted? Have you counted the years? If you, matter of fact, especially for our institute, take the time to really sit back and say, wait a minute, when did my struggles with this begin and why has it gone on for decades? The year before I started struggling, it was, it was an issue. But at, what was going on in my life at the time where now I'm, I, I not only tasted it, touched it, and it was introduced to me, but why has it never left me? I have now taken this thing in to my adulthood. And I'm older now, and I'm still struggling with this. The Bible says she had an issue for 12 years. The Bible says she spent all her, her what? Somebody says uh, they, they were in the issue of trying to, they were on a patch. They were on a patch and they were trying to, 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 to break cigarettes. And they sit down and they did the cost of how many packs they were purchasing a day. And when they did it, they said, man, the amount of money that I've spent 
in my addiction and then in comparison the amount of money that they're going to have to spend to break it think about those two categories the amount of money that you've spent to while out <laughs> you know what's most expensive all the time you spent in sin and wasted blessings it was never worth it even as you sit here today wasn't that party off the chain oh that party was wild wasn't it wasn't it great but what do you have to show for it now nothing but what it left you with is bad memories you hoping one of those videos don't resurface you're hoping, you're hoping that somebody on the balcony didn't take a picture of you down and say, hey, I know who that is. You hope TNZ don't point the arrow at you. Say, that's you. What did it leave you with? For 12 years, she spent all her living with her issue, trying to fix her issue. The Bible says she went to physicians, she went to Hova, trying to fix something. She has not always struggled with this. But for the last 12 years, it has, it has broken her. She now has no more money. She spent all of her living trying to fix that thing that's at the end of her resume. I got an issue. And everybody in here has a what? Everybody in here has a has an issue. So he says, I tell you nay, but except you repent, you will all likewise what? Now he's talking to the living. So here's what he says. And here's the picture of it. I know you've been going for a long time, but there may be some of you who are stuck. And if you ever prayed to God, God, if you could just get me out of this. You may be in something dysfunctional. You may be in a bad situation. You may be whatever your situation is on this morning. He said, Lord, I want to get to a better place. I don't like where you, where I am. Have you ever said that to yourself? God, I don't like where I am. I have tried to the best of my ability to fix this situation, to get rid of this situation, to get rid of these vices. But God, I want to get out. I need help. He says, the first thing that you need to do, he says, I tell you nay, but unless you repent, you'll perish. Now, repentance has at least two legs to it. The first leg, the word repent doesn't necessarily mean you've sinned. So if I tell you I repent, it doesn't mean that I've sinned because you have to understand the definition of repentance. The definition of the word repent, the first leg of repent means to change your mind. So if you went up to McDonald's uh, and you said, uh, no, Big McDonald's is a bad example. Uh, some stuff going on at McDonald's. If you went to Burger King, if you went to Burger King, okay, 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 okay. <laughs> it's, it's, it's okay, it's okay. Uh, if, if you went up to Sonic, all right, we okay? If you went up to Sonic, I'm sorry, if you went up to Sonic, and you picked something, but you changed your mind, you hit the little red button again and say, I I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I don't want that. I want the extra long cheese coney with the chili cheese tater tots and the Route 44 stripe. I'm yeah, yeah, supersize all of that. When you change your mind, you just repent it. So anytime you change your mind, that's repentance. When it comes to God, when you're in a position and you're going in a way that's not pleasing and acceptable unto God, he says, I tell you nay, until you, you change. So here's number one. If you're gonna experience a breakthrough, you have to acknowledge yeah. that you're in a bad place. 
God is a very difficult thing for God to help anybody who first doesn't acknowledge that they're in a bad place. If you refuse to acknowledge that your stuff is dysfunctional, you driving up to the light and somebody will say, hey man, your car is smoking. You say, no, we're good. No, nah, man, your car, your car is smoking. Have a good day. And you drive off. The next person on that side, hey, your car is on fire. Happy Monday. And you keep driving, nobody can help you. You know why nobody can help you? Because you refuse to stop and you refuse to acknowledge you need help. Have anybody ever uh, uh, went out to, to lunch with your family? And, and, and your family uh, is at each other's neck and somebody said, hey, your family okay, everything? Yeah, we're great. <laughs> you sure? This, this, this looks dysfunctional. Oh, no, we do that all the time. Just because you do something all the time don't make it healthy. Just because you talk to each other that way all the time doesn't mean that that's healthy. Just, just because nobody else says anything about it doesn't mean it's not broken. Say, hey man, your coffee table may, that scotch tape ain't gonna hold that much long. You, you may need to get that replaced. No, 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 that's good. It's good, just paint it brown. It's good. Hey, it's still, that's dysfunctional. That's, that's broken. Some of you, you complain about your jobs because something's wrong at your job. Something is wrong and the spirit is telling. Matter of fact, your spirit won't let you be at peace at your job. And you know like, I don't know if I'm supposed to be here. Something, something's not right, Some, something's wrong. And you know something's wrong, but you keep getting up every morning, going to the same place, doing the same thing over again. And some gotta change. Have you ever just need to look in the mirror and admit to yourself, this whole life I'm living is dysfunctional. Me crying every two days, that's dysfunctional. Something, when your body cries, that's the sign something's wrong and you gotta find out what's wrong. You having a nervous breakdown every six hours? If you do it frequently, people will leave you alone. They'll be like, oh, she just do this. She just, she hit her head against the wall like this. She, this, she, she okay. Just give her a few minutes and she'll be back at work. No, somebody else steps in and says, no, 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 that's not normal. You gotta be careful of people who treat your dysfunction like normal. Because those people are the ones that's keeping you in dysfunction longer. Yeah. Let, a, let a new person walk in your house and ask, what's that? What's that? And you didn't even notice it. <laughs> is, is, that, is that a wet rag? Is that around here or something? Is, <laughs> something smell. You know what you would do when they leave? Because you had a new person coming to your environment, you know what you will do? You burn that lights out, hopefully, hopefully. <laughs> You'll get to cleaning. You know why? Because you had a fresh nose that come in and say, no, something don't smell right. Yeah. right. Something, something's not as clean Man. As, as it. Have you ever just looked around in your house and say, no, this is dysfunctional. I'm not supposed to have all my clothes on the floor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and why is it I don't, I don't, wash, I don't wash my clothes? Huh. You know something's wrong when you don't take when you don't take showers two and three days, for two and three days? And, and, and don't laugh because for, there are some, when you're depressed, when, you, when you're dealing with depression, you don't wanna get out the bed. You don't wanna wash your face, you don't wanna brush your teeth, you don't wanna answer the door, you don't wanna, you don't wanna uh, look at the sun, you don't wanna go outside, you don't wanna do anything. That's the sign something's wrong. Don't let anybody make you feel like dysfunction is good. When your heart is beating irregularly and you out of breath, when you get up, uh, uh, when you take a few steps, your body is saying something's wrong. When you start sweating uncontrollably and you start getting dizzy, you don't tell it, oh, that's just, you know, it's just Tuesday. No, it's not Tuesday. Something's wrong. 
And once you acknowledge, the first thing that you have to acknowledge is all, I know you got a great resume. Stop focusing on the great things that are in your life and ignore, because whatever you ignore doesn't get better. When you, when you ignore dysfunction, when you keep glossing over it, you know what happens? It disappears to you, but it's still clear. Whatever you refuse to acknowledge, you can't repent for. Huh. How many sins have you committed? If, when, here's why it's important to study the Bible. When you don't study the Bible, you don't feel a need to repent because nothing's brought to your, your, your remembrance. Which brings me to the second leg of repentance. One means to change your mind. You need to change your mind about what you're in. Because if you don't change your mind, you'll stay there. Yeah. You'll keep doing the same thing over and over and over again. Why? Because you think about that thing the same way. Man, forget y'all. It feel good. Sin feel good. I like sin. Sin, sin make me go to bed at night. Make me curl up. I feel great. Until you change the way you think about it Yeah, it may make me feel good, but man, this is hurting God And because this is hurting God I hate What now hurts God even though it makes me feel good So now I hate it If I was doing something that hurts you and I love you I gotta change how I think about it because this is hurting the relationship. Y'all see that? Yeah. So because what you're doing, if it's hurting your relationship with God, he said, if you don't change your mind on how you think about that, what does it say at the end of the verse? You ain't gonna make it. You gonna perish. You gonna perish in your dysfunction. The second leg of repentance is remorse is sorrow have you ever sinned and you didn't feel nothing have you ever have you ever just cursed and you didn't feel nothing bleep 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 <laughs> have somebody ever brought sin to your attention and your response after they brought it to your attention was well, shoot, I'm a man. I'm a, I'm a man. <laughs> what'd, you, what'd you expect? Shoot, I mean, I'm a, I'm a black man, too. <laughs> Whatever that means. <laughs> yeah. Instead of saying, you know what, you're right. The word of God does say that. You justify your sin by talking about your circumstances and your weaknesses. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And you're going to perish. Because repentance demands at least two things. For you to change your mind about how you think about it. Yeah. And you need to feel something. Yeah. You don't feel nothing. You don't feel, you don't feel bad. You, you don't feel no remorse. Here's what happens when you sin and you don't feel nothing. It means something is dead inside. Yeah, man, man. If your child comes to you and say, Daddy, Mama, you hurt me. If you love them at any level, your next question is, baby, what, what, what happened? Because you care. If God's word says that hurts me and you don't feel nothing, I mean, how you feel nothing? You don't feel nothing. I mean, for all have what? All have sinned. So we're not talking about if you sin. All of us have sinned before. The problem is, did you feel anything? You didn't feel nothing. I mean, you've been doing it for weeks and months and years and you don't feel nothing. Like. At least feel bad when you do it. I'm still doing it, but I feel, feel something. You don't feel nothing. 
And when you don't feel nothing, that's when you stay in it longer. When you don't, when you don't feel anything, when you go places that you're not supposed to and you involve and, and you engage in things that you're not supposed to engage in, matter of fact, you don't feel anything. You get up, right? Because you're coming back again tomorrow. You don't feel anything. There's no, there's no godly sorrow in your spirit. And you know what? That's not acknowledging it. You got to be willing to acknowledge when something is wrong. Something's broken. And the first thing that God wants from you, God says, God says, look, I already know it's broken. I want to work with you. But I need you to acknowledge that this is broken as well. Have you ever been a, a, a part of the church where the people are fighting in the parking lot, people stabbing each other, doing service? <laughs> Have you ever been a part of a congregation, I know not North Colony, where people playing on their phones, playing Tetris, doing a worship service? People, people talking about other stuff, doing worship? Shouldn't you say, mm, something's wrong? Maybe here's the problem. Maybe we've been around dysfunction for so long, we don't know what health looks like. When I was growing up, I know he got, you know, he got his issues, but, but when I was growing up, you had the Brady Bunch was on reruns. You had the Partridge family, came in on the afternoons. I don't know, uh, a few of y'all remember the Partridge family. Uh, I think the monkeys, remember the, the monk, that was another one. <laughs> then you had Bill Cosby, you had the Cosby show. Yeah. All the shows growing up, you had the father, you had the mother, you had the children, and they were living life and working problems out together. And at the end of every episode, the goal of the show was to bring the family back together to solve problems. You almost can't find a show on television today where you got the father loving the mother and the children and the family trying to work out problems together without there being dysfunction in it. Uh, there's a show called, uh, I believe, Blackish or something like that, which is almost the, kind of the best picture that you can have, but you still got the, you still got the, uh, you still got grandpa who was the gigolo. <laughs> and, and, and you got grandma who's still sleeping around with her men and cussing and doing whatever. And then you, 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 got, you have so much dysfunction in it, it's entertainment. But when was the last time you watched something that was wholesome and you say, now that's the goal? God is standing before all of us and saying, listen, Raise your standard of what's healthy. Yeah. Yeah. Man. Man. You can't live a clean life, but you first got to, before you sweep it up, you first have to acknowledge it's dirt. If you think dirt is decoration, you'll leave it in the room. Dirt is not decoration. It's dirt. And once you first acknowledge that it's dirt, then you got to what? You got to clean it up. You, when he had seen it, repented not afterwards, that you might believe. He says this, when John came to preach God's word to you, you listened to John, but you didn't repent. Even though the prostitute who sells her body to live, to eat, to pay rent, she's on the street corner every day defiling her body. But this is what Jesus says about the prostitute. But when John came and preached to her the truth and she heard what was right, even though she did all those things, the Bible says when she heard it, when the, when the harlots heard it, they stopped and they repented 
What does repentance mean? It's two legs. They changed how they thought and they felt something and they were moved with remorse. Notice the two things that are needed. He says they repented, but you didn't. You kept the same mentality and you felt nothing. Whenever your mind stays the same and your feelings stay the same, your situation stays the same. Brother Williams, I'm stuck. Two things are gonna be needed. You're gonna need to change your mind. And you're gonna need to change your feelings. Until you get disgusted about where you are, you'll stay there and keep decorating it. 